You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut to the chase right away today, okay? I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm just going to tell you, here's the main point. Here's the big idea. I'm not going to bury the lead. Ready? Here we go. And then I'm not going to sit down quite yet. Okay, but, but I'm going to tell it to you. Here's the deal. On a day like today, on an every day of our lives, Easter changes everything. Easter changes everything. Not in some small, insignificant way. Not just for today, but also for eternity. And not only for eternity, but also for today. Easter changes everything. The problem and the temptation and the danger, I think, for all of us, certainly for me, I know I experienced this in my life, and and you're probably not unlike me, and so you probably experienced it too. The danger and temptation and tension we face in life is that so often we get sucked into the immediate. And we put all of our cards there. And therefore, because life has a way of beating us down and beating us up and knocking us around a little bit, we get frustrated, we get worn out, we begin to lose confidence. We begin to lose hope. We begin to lose vision. And we begin to lose trust in the God that we worship today and in the word that we hear from this God. You see, so often we look at Easter and we say, oh, when's Easter this year? Oh, Easter's April 20th. Awesome, great. There's not going to be snow. Maybe. (laughs) Seriously, this is my first Easter in Michigan. Okay, this is my first Easter with you here at the chapel. I didn't know if I'd be able to say that a couple weeks ago. Okay, I didn't know if I'd be able to say that a few days ago. But, okay, April 20th, there's no snow. Sweet, that's fantastic. But, but for so many of us, Easter becomes this nice little holiday that celebrates optimism, that kind of gives us this uh, breath of fresh air that reminds us spring is here or it's just around the corner. Baseball has started. Pastels are in. Graduations are coming soon. I mean, all this kind of stuff. We get this sense that, you know what? Easter, Easter, Easter. Easter's this great little holiday and and spring cleaning and I'm going to lay mulch soon and pretty soon we got to get the lilies and the flowers and just smells great and looks great and, and kids look great and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Families gather together. And so Easter becomes a nice little holiday. But when Easter only becomes a nice little holiday, we miss out on this statement. And we don't receive it fully in our lives. You see, Easter does change everything. Changes everything. And one great symbol of that, which you see all over our church today, is the Easter lily. The Easter lily is actually an ancient symbol of new life. The Easter lily is a sign of victory. You know, when I walked into the chapel this morning about 8 o'clock, I walked in and I'm like, woof! There's flowers in here, okay? It, it, had the, it had the lily smell. There's a sense of vibrancy. There's something there. The Easter lily, though, we kind of cheat with it a little bit because technically it blooms the most in the summer, but we've got it today, okay? And, and we see it in churches all over, all over America, certainly, and maybe even all over the world. Easter lilies are a big part of this celebration that we're having today. And yet... Those Easter lilies looked like this not too long ago. That doesn't smell pretty, okay? Small, it's dirty, kind of nasty looking. There's signs of some things happening here, but, but in all reality, this little bulb is designed to go one place. Buried into the ground. What you don't see all over the chapel this morning are a bunch of those. You see Easter lilies, but you don't see those. Let's talk about that for a minute as we talk about the resurrection. You see, to anybody of any time, a bodily resurrection is almost inconceivable. To anybody... Of any time, a bodily resurrection is almost inconceivable. 
As we look at the Easter bulb, as we look at the Easter lily, as we see the new life and the new creation, that in, from a bulb comes this Easter lily. Let's think now about the reading that Victor led us through from John chapter 20. I mean, after all, this was a resurrection reading. But to be quite fair to all of us, to anybody of any time, a bodily resurrection is almost inconceivable. You know, if John's gospel had ended with chapter 19, it would have been like every other great biography of all time. The leader would have been dead and buried and put into the ground. And quite honestly, it wouldn't have been the first time that that would have happened in the first century. It wouldn't have even been the first messianic leader that would have been killed in such a way and death been the final straw. You see, in the decades before and in the decades after even the time of Christ, there were plenty of messianic leaders who claimed to be the ones who would deliver Israel. And yet, here's what happened. In all their cases, the leader died, and that was kind of it. Ball game. End of story. People took their bat and ball and went home. But something else happened in the life of Jesus. Because it was what happened after his death that actually caused things to explode and things to change. So if we look at John chapter 20, we see a man, a bulb, who's placed into the ground. We, we see one who made extraordinary claims in his life. And yet if we ended at chapter 19, he would have been like every other man. And yet especially for those of you today, who have a hard time accepting the resurrection. You can accept the birth, okay? That's, that's okay. That's a little more natural. But if you have a hard time accepting the resurrection, pay close attention with me to John chapter 20. Because admittedly, the resurrection is crazy. It is crazy. I'll be the first one to admit it. It's a miracle. The greatest one of all time. If you have a Bible with you, if you brought one, if not, that's totally okay. You're going to see some of the words up on the screen. I'm flipping in my Bible to John chapter 20. In fact, you could even open your worship folder. You're going to see some of these words in there as well for our gospel reading. John chapter 20, we're looking at verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. Okay, who got up this morning and it was still dark? Who got up this morning and it was still dark? Okay, some of you. All you college students, awesome, me too. No, just kidding, okay. It wasn't, no. It was not really dark when I got up either. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. You know, what do you notice? Who's missing here? Who do you, who's missing? The guys. The guys are missing, okay? There's no guy disciples around here in John chapter 20. Now, the other gospels do tell us that Mary Magdalene and the other women were there, but they were there for a purpose. They were there in order to bring spices for a dead body. Did Jesus die? Yes, Jesus died in an unimaginable, suffering, painful, horrible death. He died in excruciating pain. He died and was executed like a criminal. Jesus wasn't half dead. Jesus died. And Jesus' dead body was placed into a tomb, like a bulb, placed into the ground. After all, the disciples weren't expecting a resurrection. Yet. They weren't expecting a resurrection Yet, when they buried the body of Jesus, they buried it expecting decomposition, expecting decay. And so when the women come to the tomb, in John chapter 20, on that first Easter morning, what do they expect to find? A corpse. They expect to find a dead body. And so when the tomb is empty, first thought, who took him? What happened? Somebody stole him. I thought the Roman soldiers were going to be guarding this tomb. What happened? So we see in verse 2, So she, Mary, came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. The other disciple is John, 
the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. I love verse 4, by the way, okay? Both were running, but the other disciple, <coughs> the author of the gospel, okay, very humbly states, the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. It's like, yeah, I beat the old guy, you know? I beat, beat the old man, you know, the young guy beat the old guy, okay? It's fine, you know, the, the little guy beat the big guy. Let's just make note of that for all of history to see, okay? All right, so that 2,000 years later, at this church in Ann Arbor, Michigan, we'd be still talking about it, okay? So the other disciple outran Peter. Now look at verse 5. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen. Now why would he bend over? Well, well the tombs back then, they were cut, and then you would actually bend down, look in, and then kind of get into the tomb. So he bends over, not fully committing, but certainly looking in there before you would step in and things would kind of open up. So he sees something. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself separate from the linen. Now the point of this verse is not you should make your bed every morning, okay? Because it was all nicely folded and everything else. So you should make your bed every morning, okay? Bible says so, right? Okay, maybe, maybe not, not. Okay, but you see the nicely folded linen just lying there. There it is. This dead body, this corpse that they're looking for is gone. Well, look at verse 8. Look at what happens when John enters the tomb. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. He saw and believed. Now, in the chronology here, okay, Mary Magdalene follows Peter and she follows John. Then they leave, but notice who stays there. I think this is fascinating. Mary stays there. Mary stays there by the tomb. I think that says something about Mary's persistence. I think it says something about her love for Jesus. But I think it also speaks to her curiosity. Where is he? Where is he? And so we jump ahead to verse 15, and we see this question. Because this man, who is Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him, comes to her, and she asks this key question. This key question in verse 15. Who is it you're looking for? Let me ask that of you today. Who is it that you're looking for? How would you answer that question? Because undoubtedly, undoubtedly, you know, there are, there are a bunch of us here today. We're here because we believe in Jesus we believe in the resurrection of the dead. We, we celebrate his life. We, we love Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our lives. And so we're here often. That's some of us, but that's probably not all of us. It's probably not all of us. And that's okay. What is it you're looking for? Why are you here? Because my parents made me. Because grandma wants me because I was told I had to? Who is it you're looking for? Who is it? Not what are you looking for today. That's not the, that's not the question. Who is it that you're looking for? Let's all answer that today. In your life, who is it that you're looking for? Because the one who asked the question himself today gives us the answer. He says, I'm here. Those of you at the chapel today, I'm here. I, I'm here. I, I'm alive. I care about you. I know what's going on in your life, little Griffin. I died for you. I was raised from the dead for you. 
I know the concerns of your heart. I know the anxiety you feel sometimes. I know how you get sucked into thinking about the, the immediate and you lose focus and you lose trust and you lose hope. But I'm here. And I love you with an unbelievable and undying love. Who is it today that you're looking for? You know Bono. You all familiar with Bono? Of course we are. Bono, the lead singer of U2. You know, he's like a lot of us. I mean, we're not probably as talented as him in many respects, but as a human being, he's a lot like us. He's a mixed bag. There's some probably really, really good things. He's a huge philanthropist, activist. But like him, like us, we all have a dark side, we all have a shadow side, we all have sin affecting and infecting our lives. And yet recently, Bono did an interview with RTE, a television station in Ireland. And in that interview, Bono said some pretty incredible things. I want you to pay attention and listen to his testimony and profession of faith, especially the words that he shares as you see this short video clip. Take a look. I look to the scriptures for poetic truth, um, as well as the sort of historical stuff I'm, I'm, I'm in, interested in. And of course, there was a histo historical Jesus. You know, I'm talking about God. Oh, right. And, and do well, you... I see, I'm, the, per the person of Christ is my way to understand uh, God. Do you pray? Yes. To whom or what do you pray? To and Christ. In way? To Christ. Yeah. And, and what do you pray for? I pray to get to know um, the will of God, because then the prayers have more chance of coming through. I mean, that's the thing about prayer, isn't it? I mean, we don't do it in a very lofty way in our family. There's just a bunch of us on the bed, usually. We have a very big bed in our house. And all our, we've prayed with all our kids. We, we you know, we just, we, we read the scriptures, we pray. It's not even regular. Sometimes if we go to church on a Sunday, we go when the church has ended and we'll just go in on our own as a family. For peace and quiet. And For peace and quiet. And we'll pray, usually about people that we know who are struggling with something, um, illness so, so, or so whatever. So then, what or who was Jesus as far as you're concerned? I think it's, the, it's a defining question for a Christian, is who was Christ. And, and I don't think you're let off easily by saying a great thinker or a great philosopher or, a, a, you know, because actually he went round saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He was crucified because he said he was the Son of God. So he either, in my view, was the Son of God or he was not. No, no, nuts. Nuts, yes. Forget yes. rock and roll messianic <laughs> complexes. This is like, I mean, Charlie Manson type delirium. And I find it hard to accept that all the millions and millions of lives, half the earth for 2,000 years, have been touched, have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nutter. I just, I don't believe it. I, so I think, therefore it follows that you believe he was divine. Yes. And therefore it follows that you believe that he rose physically from the dead. Yes, yeah, I mean, uh, I have no problem with miracles. <laughs> I'm living around them. I am one. So, so when you pray then, you pray to Jesus. Yes. The risen Jesus. Yes. And you believe that he made promises which will come true. Yes. I do. Could it be any more clear? from his perspective, out of his life and out of his faith. So when you pray, you pray to Jesus. Not God, not someone out there, not someone that might be able to give a new hope and new life for my life. Who do you pray to? Jesus. You pray to Jesus. You see, Bono knows what I hope you grab hold of today. And that is that Easter changes everything. It gives confidence, it gives hope, and it gives new life. When we read the scriptures, when we see John chapter 20, when we look at what Christ has accomplished for us, it then doesn't matter what the world throws at me. It doesn't matter what the world throws at you. Cancer, career loss, 
Broken relationships, broken bones. When Jesus died, he was raised to new life and became a new creation. That doesn't mean then that little improvements can be made in our lives, but that because of Jesus, fundamentally, our lives are changed. It's true for Griffin today, and it's true for all of us. When we die, when that day comes, death is not the final word. Death is not the end of the story. When we die, and we've probably all been to Christian funerals, when we've placed our loved ones, as difficult as it is, when we've placed them into the ground, we place them knowing that there's hope, knowing that there's more to the story, knowing that when a bulb is put in the ground, what comes out is not just a bulb, but it's a new creation. It's new life. It's different. And our lives are different as a result. You see, because of Jesus, I know. I know that my life has purpose. I know that I can live today, and by the way, I know tomorrow too. When I'm outside of the church setting, when I'm not in here, when I'm at work, when I'm interacting with my neighbors, I know that I can live with hope. I know that my prayers are heard. I know that I can have confidence. I know that I can trust. I know that though life is difficult, and it is difficult. I know that this is not it. I know that God is writing a much bigger story in all of our lives, and it's the story of new life and the resurrection. And so I know on this Easter day, and I pray that you do too, that my Redeemer lives. I know that Christ has risen today, and I know that that changes everything for all people of all time. Let's pray.